Dr. Wynne Smith will now deliver the commencement address. Good evening, President Leshen, Chairman Mullen, Dean Canosano, Provost Burston, Vice Provost Vernescu, faculty, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. I am so honored to have my life's work recognized by this great university and to be counted among the honorary degree recipients of such high distinction. Let me congratulate Dr. Audrey Carlin for her tremendous achievement and recognition today as a true pioneer for women and for science and for American competitiveness. <laughs> and let me also recognize Professor Hefferman for receiving the WT WPI Trustees Award for his excellence in teaching and leadership. I'm very honored to share in this seminal milestone as we come together to celebrate the hard work and achievements of the masters and doctoral graduates of the class of 2017 of WPI. We congratulate you as you embark upon the journeys that will shape the next chapter in your personal and professional lives. As you heard, I was trained as an anthropologist at Vassar College when it was still all women, and as a classical archaeologist at King's College, Cambridge University. These disciplines have given me a powerful lens to examine the continuum of human civilization. And what comes into sharp focus when one looks through this lens is that the creation, mastery, and use of new knowledge and technology have always been the drivers, the shapers, and the determinants of which cultures, societies, and economies have flourished, have gained geopolitical power, and changed the very course of history. Across the millennia, and accelerated with the emergence of complex cities some 7,000 years ago, we witnessed the ever-expanding spiral of innovation in the footprints of technology and in the handprints of inventors and entrepreneurs who have collectively created our world. Indeed, the development of my hometown, Akron, Ohio, the rubber capital of the world, is indebted to the passion and perseverance of a great inventor and industrialist, Charles Goodyear, and the creation of the new industries enabled by his 1844 patent on the vulcanization of rubber, an invention that created and forged new industries in the industrial might of the American Midwest that also led to our military strength that helped us win World War II. And this story of urban development, invention, and business innovation is the story of Worcester and its manifold contributions to building the prosperity and security of America and also creating value around the world. Rising out of innovative genius, entrepreneurship, and the mastery of technology, just imagine booming 19th century Worcester. Smokestacks were still spewing, the machinery was humming, the products were rolling out, destined for distant markets, destined to change America, and destined to change the world. Imagine the pulsating streets crowded with thousands of workers who lived in the city's three-deckers and who ate at the night lunch carts that brought food to factories, pioneered, patented, and produced by the Worcester Lunch Car Company, a prototype diner, an iconic symbol of Americana. Founded in 1831, and a main economic driver for the city, and I saw their headquarters today, Washburn and Moen grew into the largest wire manufacturing company in the world, the first to have continuous drawing of wire, giving birth to the modern wire industry 
and developing the most effective method to produce wire for the new burgeoning telegraph industry that launched the communications revolutions that are still underway today. And as the largest producer of barbed wire in the country, this Worcester company was instrumental in the settlement of the American West. So let's look at some of Worcester's entrepreneurs, risk takers, and disruptors. In the mid-1800s, Esther Howland, the first woman in the United States to use assembly line production way before Henry Ford, she made Valentine's Day cards in her home, establishing Worcester as the epicenter of the commercial Valentine industry. Loring Coase invented the monkey wrench and Russell Hawes the first envelope folding machine. In 1837, William Chompton invented the first power loom capable of intricate designs, revolutionizing the textile industry of New England and its vast global dominance in textiles. And by 1872, Knowlton was the biggest woman's hat factory in the world. Joshua Stoddard, inventor of the steam Calliope, established his American steam music company in Worcester, providing Calliopes to riverboats and circuses. And I understand that when you take a riverboat cruise on the Mississippi, they're still playing the music on the Calliopes coming from the American steam music company of Worcester. By 1880, Samuel Winslow's company was the largest producer of skates in the country. Records from the 1889 uh, census indicate that workers turned out 1,200 pairs a day, offering 40 styles of ice skates and 15 styles of roller skates. In 1938, Reed and Prince became the first screw producers in the world to perfect the manufacture of recessed head screws so that only one size screwdriver was needed to turn any screw size, saving time and cost on the assembly line and enabling greater productivity. And this company's fasteners were used in half of all World War II aircraft. Now down the road, Worcester native's son and WPI alum Robert Goddard, the father of modern rocket propulsion, dreamed of going to the moon and launched the first successful world's liquid fuel rocket in 1926 at Auburn, Mass, epitomizing the WPI motto of theory and practice that still sets the standard of excellence and unique education provided here at WPI. Worcester's innovators went on to make major contributions to U.S. leadership in space, pioneering flight suits, anti-gravity suits, including the one worn on the first U.S. spacewalk, and the headsets Neil Armstrong used on the moon to talk with friends and family back home. The industrialists of 19th century Worcester understood the competitive advantage of high-value-added manufacturing in building a vibrant, prosperous city. In 1889, Charles Washburn, who went on to be a representative of Massachusetts in the U.S. House of Representatives, wrote, and I quote, we need not fear the natural advantage of other sections of the country, for there must always be conducted here the manufacture of the finer grade of goods requiring intelligent and delicate manipulation, end quote. These 19th century leaders of industry understood then, as we know today, that new firms and new industries must be nurtured in an innovation-friendly environment and that manufacturing matters in the continuous spiral of innovation, creativity, wealth creation, and prosperity. Local entrepreneurs built factories and rented space to machinists and mechanics with ideas, but with limited capital incubating their businesses at low cost so that Worcester became known as a paradise for mechanics. And very importantly, this was a major factor in the diversity of Worcester's industrial base that produced skilled jobs and provided good wages for its citizens. Charles Washburn reported in 1889 that workers' wages were always on the rise and they shared an increasing portion of the profits coming from the industrialization. Indeed, Charles went on to say, and I quote, advanced 
avenues for advancement are always open to the capable and the industrious. From their ranks will come the leading businessmen of the next generation upon whom the continuance of prosperity will depend." End quote. And it was these innovative, hopeful, future-oriented entrepreneurs and industrialists who, in 1865, were very innovative in not just providing the land, but the free funding for the Worcester Free Institute of Industrial Science, today's WPI. Now, I am sure all of you are wondering at this point why on your graduation day, when you're looking into the future, you are hearing a mini lecture on the industrial history and past of Worcester about its wire makers, hat makers, machinery makers, and tool makers. Because the story of Worcester captures the very essence of why innovation matters more than ever and why high value advanced manufacturing matters for America. And just as these men and women built a thriving economy that benefited so many, you graduates now stand ready to be the inheritors of this proud legacy. As distinguished graduates of WPI, each and every one of you has an obligation to use your knowledge, your ingenuity, and your imagination to transform our world for the better and solve the great global challenges of our day. And you will be able to use, for the first time in human history, the most powerful tools and greatest collective cumulative knowledge of humankind in forging that future. For humanity now stands in the midst of the greatest revolutions in science and technology, a new age of unparalleled knowledge, vast technological power, and inconceivable innovation is unfolding before our eyes. The digital, the biotechnological, nanotechnology, and cognitive revolutions are colliding and converging at warp speed to rewrite the rules of production and services in digital code, genetic code, atomic code, and neural code in ways we could only imagine a decade ago. WPI scientists and engineers are working at the very forefront of these game-changing technologies that will shape the future, will determine again where will economic activity flourish, where wealth will be created, how will humans progress, how will society advance, what kind of planet, what kind of physical world will we bequeath to our children? In your hands, we must harness these technologies to capture the boundless opportunities of this new transformative age, moving from a mindset of scarcity and limitation to one of abundance and opportunity. Let us look at genetics. The dramatic cost reduction in sequencing any genome now enables us to leverage biotechnology for business, health, and agriculture and social good on a global scale. A new era of abundance in agriculture and food production will meet the needs of a growing world population and the imperative to double global food production by 2050. But biotechnology has been rocked by a seismic event. With the invention of gene editing technology, the godlike power to cut and paste bits of DNA wherever one wants into the genome of any living thing with heretofore unimaginable precision and potent efficacy. This is one of the most powerful technologies ever discovered by mankind, humankind, womankind, giving direct access to the very code of life with the potential to alter not just who we are, but also to alter all of the world's natural living ecosystems. Then there is the constant, ever-morphing digital disruption. The physical world and the digital world are converging across numerous dimensions through sensors, networks, and a data tsunami. We are connecting things on a scale once unimaginable through not the Internet of Things, but the Internet of Everything. This data tsunami, already of fantastic scale, is doubling in size every two years, and pouring into every area of society and the global economy. Make no mistake, 
This exponential proliferation of data is more than a big deal. Think about how the microscope revolutionized biology and medicine and how the telescope revolutionized our understanding of the university. Now imagine giving tools of such profound consequence to every field of human endeavor. Welcome to the new age of illumination, a data revolution that will reveal invisible worlds across the spectrum of human inquiry and human existence. Graduates, as future scientists and engineers, doctors, managers, executives, entrepreneurs, government leaders, and military officers, you will face profound ethical and moral responsibilities and difficult conundrums in this complex world that you will inherit and shape for the next generation of humankind. What will you do with the power to rewrite the code of life? What value systems will you embed in artificial intelligence, in the service robots that will patrol our streets, or deliver patient care, or fight wars? What is to come of privacy and security as our digital lives produce digital exhaust that reveals everything about who we are, what we do, what we think, and what we want? Which cultural norms and values and ethics will you apply in either unleashing, restraining, or regulating the ever-accelerating power of these new technologies? How will you work to ensure that all Americans and citizens around the world have the skills to compete in a world of automation, of sensors and intelligent robots that are rapidly displacing workers and jobs around the world? And most importantly, how will you ensure that these powerful technologies create light for the world rather than darkness, and that they illuminate the lives of the many and not just benefit the fortunate few. As you ponder where your life's journey will take you in this tumultuous world of transformation, I cannot but reflect on my own journey launched some 40 years ago. To this day, I am queried, how could a Bronze Age Aegean archaeologist have had your career? My response, or rather my advice, humbly offered to you today is threefold. My first axiom is that a rich, relevant, and rewarding career constitutes a woven tapestry whose threads are drawn from the unpredictable challenges and unforeseen opportunities you will choose to embrace. Your tapestry will become a unique rainbow collage colored by how well you balance relentless, reoccurring risks with rational wisdom, with goodness, and with human resiliency. As America's famous Revolutionary War naval hero John Paul Jones proclaimed, and I quote, it seems to be a law of nature, inflexible and inexorable, that those who will not risk cannot win, end quote. My second axiom is to trust in your ability to perform and to achieve. Recognize both your inherent strengths and your attained capabilities. Draw upon the deep, replenishing reservoirs of your intellectual acumen and use your intuition and insight to make critical and ethical judgments. Allow yourself to think big and undertake big problems, but do so with respect for your immediate work, respect for your colleagues, and respect for your leaders. Remember that to become a leader, you must first be a follower. And my third axiom is to address complex problems and problem solving through systems design and systems thinking. Learn to see and understand the interconnections between disparate topics, disparate issues, disparate needs, and disparate opportunities. Be a synthetic thinker and bring, break the mold of linear thinking.
develop the capacity to connect the dots so as to construct the pathways for making sound decisions and creating sustainable solutions. In closing, you stand before us as the next generation of thinkers, creators, innovators, and inspired ethical leaders. You embody the capability and harbor the responsibility to construct a new sustainable future for our nation and for our world. Bestowed with the power of knowledge, you must now embrace the hard work every generation must undertake to improve the human condition, as did the countless generations who came before you across the vast sweep of our human history. Allow me to close by quoting President Lyndon B. Johnson's eloquent words as a vision and parable for you as you enter this new age of illumination. And I quote, for this is what America is all about. It is the uncrossed desert and the uncrossed ridge. It is the star that is not reached and the harvest sleeping in the unplowed ground. Is our world gone? We say farewell. Is a new world coming? We welcome it, and we will bend it to the hopes of humankind." End quote. Godspeed. Thank you, Dr. Wynne Smith for your thoughtful and important remarks. We will carry them with us for many years to come.